Uh, so uh, thanks all for coming to the first uh, 2023 BPPB uh, seminar. And uh, it's great to have uh, two fascinating talks today. So I'm going to start it off with uh, Siddharth Goel, uh, who's going to tell us about the statistical dynamics of tumor initiation and progression. Uh, Sid, uh, take it away. Thank you, Ashok. I'm actually quite excited uh, to give this talk. I've heard so many, so many on this forum, so it's uh, it's 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 fun. Um, and again, I know the Q and A has a certain format, so I'll, I'll leave that to the uh, uh, to you guys. And you know, I'll just. Uh, but of course, don't hesitate to stop me. Okay, my slides are not going to move now. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, good. So let's start. I thought you know it's a broad audience, so I thought I'll introduce a little bit about what I what particular aspects of tumor I think, which I'll touch upon, uh, but also give you a very one minute broad uh, uh, introduction. Um, so, I mean, causes of tumors are are wide, you know, of a very large variety. I mean, one of the first ones were diagnosed were caused by viruses, actually. Um, um, and then people discovered that actually chemicals cause tumors, you know, and they were putting uh, different kinds of paints on the back of a mouse. Uh, you could immediately see sort of tumor uh, uh, incidence rate going going higher. Um, and of course, now we know age is a great predictor of tumor, uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. Um, so there was a bit of a confusion when uh, in the early you know, time of, of tumor research that what is it actually happening? All these various causes seem to be causing the same disease. Um, um, and, and this is an example of sort of age-induced tumor, if you will, like for it's, you know, in, in, uh, in blood cancer, it's called clonal hematopoiesis, where basically blood cancers really go up as the, as the, our bone marrows become more and more clonal. And, uh, and, and the simple idea is that, you know, as you go on, you sort of have uh, mutations in the stem cells, which make them fitter in the sense of, uh, you know, occupying more of the bone marrow. Uh, but at the same time, it's not clear whether they have benefit in terms of producing the right kind of blood cells. So that seems to be something which has, uh, uh, which people also look as a marker um, for, um, for tumors. Um, so it's clear that all of these sort of causes are well linked, if you think of as a very genetic basis, you know, uh, and, and that led to sort of discovery of oncogenes, which are basically, you know, spontaneous mutations, um, uh, which happen uh, 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 in embryos, and we inherit them, and that leads to uh, 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 tumors. The tumor suppressor genes, which can be inherited, uh, so they need to be sort of, um, uh, uh, and they, they suppress, in some ways, but they are recessive, but uh, you can inherit, inherit them. Um, and then you have DNA repair gene. We have like, I think something like 12 different mechanisms of repairing our DNA. As any of them breaks, our chances of sort of mutating our DNA goes up. That leads to these phenotypes. Um, so genetic basis is great. And it's also clear now, at least uh, uh, phenomenologically, that it's driven by aberrant stem cell clones or stem-like cell clones. So it's a clonal disease, uh, which uh, goes back to a single cell at some point in time. It is very tissue specific because you can inherit a, a, a tumor suppressor gene, but you might not get tumor in all your tissues, right? Um, uh, for example, retinoblastoma is a great example where um, uh, not only that only happens, not that the gene is only expressed in eye, but it manifests only in eye, but also is a huge age dependence. If you don't get it by age eight or something, you will not get it because you don't really renew your stem cells in your retina. Uh, so it's a disease which happens only in, in, in children, right? Uh, just by the virtue of how the whole thing is set up, that it needs sort of stem cell proliferation and you know it's tissue specific. What I'm interested at least broadly in some ways is, you know, uh, uh, as I said, you know, initiation and progression and there the immune system sort of comes in uh, in a very fundamental way. So now we have a very good idea that tumors are, they manifest in, in an age dependent way, but it's not that we are not generating tumors. Apparently the idea is that we really generate tumors, micro tumors all the time, but our immune system can actually eliminate them. So a bulk of the tumors are basically just eliminated, right? So you have an elimination phase for a tumor. So if that happens, you know, life goes on, nothing happens. 
some tumors can live in this equilibrium phase where they're sort of not quite eliminated, but they're not quite growing exponentially either. They're you know, sort of slowly trudging along. Um, and then there is what you know, tumor biologists call escape phase where the tumor just takes over. It basically really grows exponentially in whichever tissue. And then that leads to, I mean, exponentially I'm using in a, in a slightly loose way, um, but it sort of grows uh, uh, beyond and sort of cause physiological damage and so on and so forth. And what I'm going to talk more and more about is this idea of heterogeneity in tumors, right? And, and this heterogeneity, if you will, builds up really during the escape phase where you have a lot of proliferation going on and you sort of create a lot of heterogeneity in the cells, right? And we'll talk about heterogeneity both in terms of genetic and epigenetic. Um, so briefly, the outline of this talk is basically, I'm gonna focus first, uh, first part on tumor heterogeneity and drug response. So you have this heterogeneous tumor, which has escaped, and now how does it respond to drugs, right? Does heterogeneity play a role or it doesn't? Um, time permitting, I might come back and talk about this very early phase of tumor initiation and how microenvironment in the sense where the tumor is happening and how its early progression can actually control whether it escapes or it doesn't. Um, both of these were sort of, you know, came out a couple of years back. Uh, and uh, I'll also talk a little bit about outlook of these projects uh, as, we, as we go on. Okay, um, the first part was done uh, in collaboration with a, uh, with a, with a pathologist here um, in, in Toronto. Um, uh, the experiments were done by a postdoc, Sumi Rehman, who was an experimentalist. Um, and, and much of the theory was done by uh, a physics graduate student in my, in my group, Sophie. So, um, great. So coming back to this, this schematic. Um, so let's just sort of uh, take this cartoon a little bit more. So you're thinking of this heterogeneity. Let me just think of these heterogeneity as, you know, these single cells, if you will, right? They're sort of the bunches of cells, which are clonal and heterogeneous. Um, so the idea is if we can mark them somehow, if we can mark single cells at this stage, um, give them drugs, what do we expect? The tumor regresses. You know, so uh, uh, the, the good or bad part about it is we can't give drugs forever. So once the tumor regress, the drugs are taken off in clinical setting. And, you know, tumor regress keeps regress for a while. And most unfortunately, sometimes it can come back. It's called a relapse. Okay? The tumor relapses uh, uh, after the treatment is stopped. Um, and the question is, you know, what is the nature of this relapse tumor? Are there some special cells, special clones, which sort of are resist, I shouldn't use resistant again is, is, is a loose term, in the sense they can sort of manage to escape this drug response, they hang out in this, you know, uh, regressed tumor, and then sort of populate the tumor back. Is that what, and that would, that would basically say that the heterogeneity should be hugely reduced in a relapsed tumor, right? And then of course, it also raises a question about what's the nature of the regressed tumor state, you know? How are these cells surviving? What is really happening physiologically? Um, so these guys sort of designed an experiment which precisely was addressing this. This was a xenograft experiment where a primary tumor, uh, which Catherine operated on apparently, sort of uh, a colorectal tumor sample. Uh, they barcoded it. So now each of them has a genetic barcode. So that's what giving them color. You transplant them on mice. These are sort of immune compromised mice. So you can put human cells on them and they won't reject it uh, in, in, in that way. Um, and then you basically let the tumors grow and um, you can treat them. So you, once the tumor grows up, which is sort of like your escaped tumor, if you will, you give them drugs of different kinds um, and, and stop the treatment, let the tumor relapse and, and, and see what happens. So this is how it sort of looks. Um, so this is sort of just the mean field experiment. The tumor volume goes up. So here, of course, when you give saline or DMSO, nothing happens. The tumor just keeps growing. Um, CPT and, and fulfori in this case actually regresses the tumor. So you give it drug after letting them grow a little bit. The tumor regresses. You take the treatment off at this dotted line. And then this is the relapse tumor. To be clear that this is not a genetically resistant tumor, you can actually, so, sorry, coming back. The question is, you know, so you, you started with a heterogeneous population. Here you expect a heterogeneous population. Here you expect the heterogeneity should go down. That's our sort of, you know, expectation. 
Um, and to be clear that this is uh, not a genetically resistant tumor, you can give this tumor drugs again and it regresses again, right? This is sort of the CPT11, this is DMSO. Uh, so this is to say that this tumor is relapsing not because of a genetic mutation, it's relapsing because the treatment has gone away. Okay? So there's something which survived and came back. So genetically, they're not, they not escaped mutants, if you will, right? So, um, so this is, this is at the tumor volume stage. As I said, we were interested in heterogeneity. So what you do now is you take these samples of whatever tumor you're interested in, and all of them have a genetic code. So you can go and count by sequencing how many times you see a certain genetic code. Okay, so this is a slightly busy plot, but uh, what I want to show here is that this is basically each circle here represents the abundance of a barcode. Right? So you took all the cells, you extracted the DNA and counted how many times you saw a barcode. That should tell you how many cells has that barcode. Right? And that's the output of a single cell because everything started off with almost one or two cells. Um, so these are saline uh, uh, samples. These are different runs. So you started with the same injection, some sample of the same injection, and this is what you get as an output. This is for DMSO, 5-FU. These are all the different kind of... Uh, um, so if I remove the labels on the top, they kind of don't look very different. Right? They're all very similar. The first thing is they're very heterogeneous. Right? Some clones are way bigger than the others, and we'll quantify that a little bit more. But what was surprising was that even these regrowth tumors, which is basically have regressed and come back, really don't see any huge difference in heterogeneity, at least to the eye when seen in this way. But let's just make it more precise, right? Um, so two things to realize is there's a huge heterogeneity here. We'll plot them on log scale so you can see it. But so the 100,000 fold difference between the largest and smallest clones, right? And the second thing is we don't really see correlations between dominant clones in the background of the same treatment, right? So if I look at all these different runs with oxaplatin as the drug, it's not that the same tumor is becoming big. Sorry, same clone is becoming big, right? So you see different clones becoming big or small this time uh, uh, in different samples. Right? So this already puts a question mark in terms of, you know, having specific cells driving the relapse, right? or specifically genetic backgrounds driving the, the relapse, right? Specific cells could still be doing it, but it's not a specific genetic background that's driving the relapse. So let's sort of quantify this problem a little bit. Um, so this is what I mean when I said the uh, how are they distributed? So you can plot a cumulative fraction of clones as a relative clone size, right? And here you can see the 100,000-fold 100, 100, difference between the largest and the smallest clones. So these, this is in the frequency space. So, you know, some of the biggest clones are almost, you know, 95, 90% of the whole tumor, if you will, right? But it has a huge number of clones behind it. The first thing, and, and the black line is what you were injecting, right? So this was sort of what the, uh, the clonal distribution of the injection was, much, much, uh, 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 much less sort of uh, heterogeneity, if you will, right? Um, and, and the other thing is, these are almost indistinguishable from each other, independent of whether it was a regrowth, independent of the drug, Etc. Right. So that was sort of. A, is there a question? Uh, Sid, there's a question for clarification. What do you mean by heterogeneity here? So, so good. Is it a, the, so, yeah. Sorry. So, good. so here, all I'm saying is, if I look at this, I see lots of clones with different abundances. Right. One can quantify it in terms of entropy and things like that of the distributions, which I, I'm I'm not not going there. But the idea is that this. Uh, Plotting as a distribution, it's a broad distribution, right? That's, I'm, loose, I'm using the term a little bit loosely here, yeah. But you can compute your favorite scalar if you like from this distribution and, and you can call it, call it that, right? Um, so this has already been seen in many, many experiments where you see sort of clonal dominance. So in the field, this is called clonal dominance. You say, oh, CPT11 has one, one clone, which is 90%. 99%. So this is sort of like a clonal dominance. A few clones really dominate the tumor, which is a great view. But if you really look at the distribution, it doesn't look like that way. In the sense, it's not a bimodal distribution in that specific way to say there's a bunch of clones dominating this thing, right? So, but nevertheless, these clones are really large. So, you know, again, sort of this is where key contribution of, you know, theory comes where you just plot things in, in a different way and you sort of have a different way of thinking. So, 
I tell my students plotting is probably the, the, the biggest tool you have. Um, so in some ways you have these sort of power law like distributions, right? Which I'm calling large heterogeneity, but you know, uh, um, but usually in population genetics model, you don't usually get power law like distributions in neutral models, right? And so far what I've seen in terms of phenomenology, it looks kind of neutral in the sense that there's, you know, they are big and large clones, but there's no correlations. It doesn't look like the selection is driving this uh, in any particular way. Um, so the question, the, 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 this, the first simple theoretical question was, you know, uh, can you get these power law distributions in very simple neutral models? Um, and there is a huge literature in it, but something which we sort of uh, um, also came, came upon was that if you have growth of um, now a bunch of cells, um, so you can have sort of some kind of feedback, global feedback, if you will, and you can represent this growth as you know, um, uh, proportional to the power of one minus alpha. So if alpha is zero, this is your classic exponential growth. Um, for example, alpha half is what you see in a 2D colony growth. Right? So if only there it only grows at the edges, so you get sort of a square root type term. But if you take alpha as a parameter, you basically can get different growth kinetics. Now in the background of this, if you calculate these clone size distributions where a stem cell is giving rise to a progenitor and the progenitor grows uh, uh, in one way, you can actually get these power law like distributions where the slope here um, relates to this alpha. And again, you can see that it's not it's a power law prefactor, if you will, there's an exponential cutoff eventually for the system size and things like that. Um, but you get this slope, which basically is coming from this alpha sort of whatever the nature of the tumor growth is that's how you get this and and that sort of tells us that we're not too surprising that you kind of get the same slope so if you saw in the previous slide basically all of them were within some range so they were done very identically so this global feedback of the tumor growth has nothing to do with whether it was coming from a relapse where it was coming from this is sort of a very different kind of physiological constraint which controls these kind of slopes um, So the first thing is now we sort of start to believe ourselves that you know this is really a sort of equipotent stochastic populations of cell rather than a selected dynamics. Right? So in some ways we could sort of put put some uh, uh, um, uh, in some ways for the experimentalist you know okay maybe this is the way we should think about it rather than thinking of some clones which are special and they're driving this relapse. So that really opened up the problem in a very different direction, which, which I was very excited about because it felt like sort of some simple models can actually turn the way you, you approach the problem. Um, and then the question became, so he, good. The first thing is, this is not reduced you know, clonality. You still have lots of clones present. And in, term, in the distribution sense, they are basically identical in some way. Which clone is big here is gonna be different from which clone is big here because it's completely stochastic. Um, so that really brought the focus to this sort of regressed state, which is known in the field as drug tolerant persister state. So there's something special happening here, which is, you know, in some ways it looks like all possible cells have some chance of becoming persisters and then, you know, escaping that when the drug is gone. So it's truly sort of looks like the bacterial persister framework, if you will. It's very epigenetic, if you will. Okay. So the question, what's the nature of this? And then it goes back to the experimental question, you know, and, and what these guys did was basically extracted these cells and then looked at the RNA expression, you know, not doing single cell or anything, just bulk RNA expression. And um, these are a bit of a busy slides, there are a few plots on this, but what I want you to see is that these tumors, which uh, um, uh, regrow or, or have a DTP state, sort of look like embryonic cells. So apparently they have a bit of an embryonic signature in them. If you look at uh, um, uh, from this perspective, so sort of pause embryonic cells, if, when they're in diapause state, that's how it looks like. So what does it mean? So basically, of course you have a certain G expression state and there are many pathways which are up or down in that state. And one of them was related to autophagy. So these guys came up with a very interesting protocol. So the protocol is, you take the tumor, you regress it first, and then you give a drug, you know, in this case, it's called SB, SBI. This drug basically kills cells which are stuck in autophagy. So if the autophagy uh, uh, pathways are up, it targets them. 
So if you give this drug in the right order, which is this green line, you basically first take CPT11, regress the tumor, take the drug off, CPT11 is off, but you give it SBI, the tumor never grows back. There's no relapse. If you give CPT11, take it away, you have a relapse. If you give SBI, it basically does nothing almost. So now you sort of have this, you know, nice drug regime where you put them in regress state, then kill them in the regress state, you get no relapse. And apparently this has a huge clinical sort of corroboration where they can look at gene expression data and they can sort of talk about survival probability depending on what was measured uh, 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 for the tumors uh, uh, at different stages, regressed or relapsed or before. Um, However, this is sort of not completely a given. This is not what you should get all the time. So I'm going to briefly say about which not going to detail. We also looked at something where we were looking at temporal dynamics in context of uh, glioblastoma, which is sort of a, a, a tumor of the brain. Um, and in this case, they were actually injecting the tumor right in the, in the brain rather than sort of in the back of the mouse uh, uh, in some ways. And it turns out that there are two kinds of tumors. So glioblastoma can live in two different phases. One is a diffused phase where sort of the tumor cells really go all over the brain. In MRI, you sort of see them everywhere, but it can be a very localized tumor where it sort of grows, it grows, but very locally grows. And you see clone size distribution, which are very different depending on whether the tumor is diffused or it's local. This again goes back to that, this alpha parameter, which I was talking about, that there's sort of, that there's some global control of these, these clone size distributions. They're not, you know, in that case, it looks like you measure them same for everything, something else going on. Um, we just wanted to be clear that, you know, it can change. It depends on the tumor type and things like that. And we sort of, uh, this paper is also published, but I, I don't have the reference with me right now. So diffuse tumors, and they really respond differently. And these are the clone size distributions of, you know, diffused and, and, and clonal. I'm not going to go uh, much more into it. But maybe I'll take a minute to do uh, a little bit of outlook on what we want to do uh, with the thinking of doing. Uh, now that we have some clinical corroboration of something, but you might not be able to measure gene expression all the time. So we were thinking of more as a dynamical system. Again, the phases are, you know, active growth of tumor. You have regressed state. They could be DTP state or non-DTP state. This is something you can measure uh, uh, with the gene expression sometimes. Then you have a relapsed tumor, you know, which could be recurrent or resistant. Some, sometimes these tumors are resistant genetically, if you will, right? Relapsed tumor. Um, then there's a length of chemo. So there are lots of parameters when you look at a particular patient, right? So what was the rate of regression? What was the length of chemo treatment? Um, what was the percent of the regressed tumor? So the question we want to, and then there's time to surgery, you know, it really relapses and you can't do anything else. Rather than giving more chemos at some point in time, you, uh, uh, you know, doctors decide that you go, go for surgery, right? So the question we wanted to ask is, can we now given these let me call them very clinical parameters. Can we go back and ask similar questions about, you know, whether you get which tumors might relapse, which would have this sort of, you know, DTP driven uh, um, regressed tumor coming back because of this epigenetic state or which one would not. And it's not obvious that these very coarse parameters should have that information, but that's something we are thinking of trying, given that there seems to be two classes of tumors. The question is, do these classes also have some, you know, phenotypic, if I'm calling them phenotypic, uh, or, you know, clinical sort of parameters which also distinguish them. So very dynamical system type, type way of thinking about it. Um, but no progress as yet. Um, how much time do I have, uh, Ashok? Uh, one minute. Okay, fine. So I'll, I'll quickly talk about initiation. I'll motivate the problem and, you know, leave it to that. It's again, again published. So if you get excited, you, you, can, you can read it. Um, this was done with, uh, in collaboration with Anton here, which many of you may know, and, and a graduate student. Um, so the question we were interested in is this early stage, you know, and there's now enough evidence that there is not only genetic, but there's a huge epigenetic switching going on between cancerous and at least precancerous states. And the other element is very clear is that you have microenvironments, which feeds back. So we wanted to capture sort of this in a, in a toy model and ask some very simple question about, you know, the rate at which you might generate tumors, which has a whole field, you know, valley crossing problems, multiple mutations and all that is a whole sort of, uh, but uh, we didn't quite find epigenetics and microenvironments integrated in them. So we were sort of thinking of that. 
So the simple model was an XYZ model, that's what we call it. Um, so you have a, a healthy green cell, which can switch back and forth between a precancerous cell. So this is sort of, you can think of it as an epigenetic switching. Once you're in a precancerous cell, you can mutate to sort of a cancer cell, which can then get more mutations from there, right? So if you need three mutations to really become cancerous, you can go from, you know, Z to Z prime to and so on and so forth. So you can represent it sort of uh, in, in a landscape way between X and Y at least. So X and Y sort of back and forth, you know, going on. Um, once you have a Y cell, it can become mutagenic. So you can start populating Z cells here. These are the dark orange one. But now there's a microenvironmental feedback. The more Z you get, the higher chance there is to actually going from X to Y, right? So more Z sort of push the landscape in a way where it, it sort of makes precancerous cells more likely. Okay. So, so that's sort of uh, uh, by this factor gamma. So I'm going to just take literally 30 more seconds and just give you the, 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 the face portraits. So if you have no feedback, no microenvironment feedback in this problem, you sort of get uh, a, a face portrait where you have two different sort of phenomenologies that either in, in this X, Y, Z plane, you have a steady state at very low X and Y, Z is your tumor state. So you basically have low Z, no tumor. Or if, you know, depending on what these growth rates are between A, B, C, you can basically latch on to having a very high tumor state. This changes drastically when you have feedback. You actually open up two new um, states, if you will, within this phase diagram, where you get a bistable state in this part where there's supposed to be no tumors. And you get sort of this weird metastable state where you get, you know, this state moves up uh, in the middle uh, and you have two unstable states, uh, which opens up in this part. Um, and what happens basically is that, yeah, there's a bistable region, et cetera. What happens is when you go into the region three, you basically are here, which was supposed to be corresponding to all Z. So you actually slow down tumor. So microenvironment feedback can actually slow down tumor progression in this region three but it can enhance tumor progression in region four. So that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, the rest of the talk was basically peeling out these things and how they go, but I can, I can take questions, but let me just summarize. So pre-tumors, you know, epigenetics and positive feedback plays a role. Here, it looks like there's an equipotent stochastic process which can explain things. Um, and I've thanked most of the people uh, and I'll plug in uh, advertisement. We are trying to do some morphogenesis with a local collaborator here. Um, someone is interested looking for people. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sid. That was really fascinating. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to maybe stick to one question and we can take the other questions after both talks are over. So Pete Kramer had this question. Uh, you showed the heterogeneity having a broader power law distribution for DN over DT is equal to N to the power of one minus alpha as alpha became smaller. Yeah. But then the power law collapses when alpha actually becomes zero. The dependence on positive alpha is consistent with my intuition, but why is alpha is equal to zero so much less heterogeneous than alpha is equal to 0 0.1? If I read the plot correctly, is there a mathematical explanation? Um, so let's make sure. So zero is this, right? So you, it's everything is continuous. There's nothing, so, so zero okay. is the blue line, which is exponential distribution, basically. Blue is, is okay. the exponential distribution. And as you raise alpha, you basically sort of start, you know, uh, giving it some slope. So 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, so it's a continuous transition. There's nothing, there's nothing discrete in that sense. So if you look at a okay. point 0.1, it's basically going to have a little bit of a slope here and then sort of fall off, if you will. Does that help? Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll just think about that. Yeah, yeah. So nothing, nothing, nothing super crazy, thankfully. 